Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 50, Church Plant, with guest Will Barlow. I'm Mark Kane. A quick note, there's news of the next UCA conference strewn about in this episode. I know more than a few of you have been asking about this. Since joining in this effort to connect Unitarian Christians, the people that I have met over the last two years, and you, you're amazing and encouraging. As you've probably noticed, I like to interview regular people, people you and I can relate to. You don't have to be famous or a PhD or an author. You simply have had to live life and been willing to tell the tale. This world is drunk on celebrity. Empty and broken people, lacking inner peace, find their meaning in others. As the Israelites lifted the golden calf and basked in the collective rush of worship, we have celebrated and elevated others, actors, leaders, and politicians, as we bask in the glow reflected back on us. They are only famous and beloved and revered because we lifted them up on our shoulders for all to see. And then, when others join in, we are justified in our idolatry. We are sustained in our wrong by the energy of the masses. We are pitiful creatures, selecting a broken specimen from among our ranks, fashioning him in the likeness of a god, and then gathering in throngs to offer our praise and worship. Then, with our adoration, we distort our idols. We create an artificial world where they begin to believe it and think of themselves as gods. They have an opinion We, by the millions, listen to everything they say. We are ruining them as we empower them to ruin us. But we welcome the symbiotic relationship that forms. They need our attention and our admiration, and we need to be distracted from our sin and pain. And together, we march the wide road, dancing and laughing, and mocking those who are missing out on the glory we've created. We humans love a good distraction. We humans recoil from the truth. Jesus showed us true greatness, to be the servant of all, to lay down your life for others, to give and give and give. Jesus' humility was real. His obedience came at a genuine cost. And I struggle to explain this to my Trinitarian friends. Their humble Lord is one who stepped out of heaven and put up with discomfort and death on our behalf. This is put on humility, an illustration of what we are supposed to be, I presume. But what we are supposed to be is not a God who condescends. We are to be obedient, humble servants. In Trinitarian theorizing, no matter how marvelously infused the eternal God was with the human body, the person who walked and talked humility and obedience, he was all-powerful and eternal. It was a performance, a show. I'm quite convinced his human life was real. The Jesus that the disciples thought they had lost, and then the one who was alive again, was not their deity wrapped in flesh. It was a man who was gone, and then who lived again, upturning their world and invigorating their witness. Eternal life became very, very real. This is why their repeated message was that this Jesus, who was killed, was now alive again. Why did this invigorate them so? Because humans don't usually do that. Gods, on the other hand, when you kill a god, you kind of expect that they aren't really dead. You don't argue in synagogues that, God has come back to life again. That's effectively nonsense. 
And despite all the amazing ways Christian teachers paint this fanciful picture of mystery, it's a message that was absent from the quills of New Testament writers. So here we are, seeking to live the humble life of our Lord, one of service and love, not of power, influence, adoration, or performance. I'm very interested in the efforts of Will Barlow and his team. I share his story not as a how-to or what is the proper way to plant a church, but because I think this is what Luke was doing when he recounted the stories of the early church in Acts, the story of their efforts to witness, to teach, to help the brethren, to feed the widows. These stories are examples of people responding to God's prompting out of love for their communities. And such is Will Barlow's story today. Will, it's great to have you with us. It's great to be with you, Mark. Big fan of the podcast. I'm excited about this conversation because your story is a unique picture of one way things can happen. You know, here we are as a, as a dispersed body of Unitarian Christians who feel sometimes no connection, sometimes light connection. Fellowship is really meaningful, and this entire conversation is going to be about your fellowship and what's happening in Louisville, Kentucky. But that'll come out in time. So you're relatively young, and you have a family already, right? Well, thanks for calling me relatively young. I actually just turned old enough a couple of years ago that you could vote for me for president. I'm 36. <laughs> uh, but yes, I've been married to my wife, Becca. She's put up with me for 12 and a half years. Mm. And uh, uh, one of the sweetest people you'd ever meet. Um, she's a nurse, and she's just fantastic. And then we have two children. My son, Liam, is five and a half. My daughter, Hannah, just turned three. Mm. And of course, uh, I just think they're the best. <laughs> How about we go back? And hear a little bit about your upbringing to make sense of how you got to where you are. Sure, Mark. I grew up in a loving Christian home. I had a great relationship with my parents, great relationship with my two younger brothers. But I also grew up in a group that many would understand, especially now, as a high-control religious group. Mm. The organization as a whole was rigid, especially on matters of doctrine, but what was interesting is I, I would not characterize the home environment that way. My dad was very open to inquiry. He always taught us to question everything. Hmm. And it didn't matter if we were attending a Catholic mass or something, which sometimes happened because my mom's family was Catholic, or if we were attending one of our church's meetings, mm -hmm. my dad always said, check everything with the Bible. It doesn't matter who it is hmm. and do the best that you can to understand these things for yourself. So that was from birth? Yes. Okay. And you didn't mention what group it was. Should we talk about that now or save that for later? <laughs> we can, yeah. I grew up uh, attending small groups in the Way International, and my parents at times ran the small Bible study that I attended, and at times we attended other people's Bible study. Mm -hmm. For people that don't understand or don't know much about the Way International structure, there is one essentially church building in Ohio, which they call headquarters. And then basically everywhere else in the world you go, there's no church building. Hmm. You're meeting in someone's home. Occasionally, like in the summer, we'd meet in parks for larger meetings or something like that. But okay. basically home Bible studies my entire life. Okay. Well, for a lot of us in the Unitarian Christian Alliance, that's as much as we can hope for. Because if you look at the map, people are spread out and some places have one, two, three people, and that's about it. So Right. Yeah, and I think it's really important that we ground this conversation with that, because what we're going to describe is not for everyone. I don't want anyone to think that we feel like we're special <laughs> or that we're privileged in some way or that I'm different than anyone else. Um, in some sense, I think God's called us to do something special. But, you know, if, if people have three people and they have a home Bible study, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. And I think it's important to just own that. And if organic Bible study growth is what you're going for, then I believe God can bless that mm -hmm. and does bless that. Then let's talk about what you're doing that is so unique. Yeah, so a couple of years ago, I started praying in earnest because we left the Way International, which was, in one sense, my hope at becoming a minister. We'd put a lot of effort, my wife and I, into becoming ministers for the Way, and it didn't work out. So we were left with, well, what do we do next? 
because that had always been both of our dream, both of our goal to serve in ministry in, in some capacity. Mm-hmm. So we've been praying about it for five years or so, I'd say maybe longer. And last year around around this time in the late winter, early spring, I was having a conversation with Sean Finnegan and Sean just asked me, hey, if we could get 20 people together, would you do a church plant in Louisville? <laughs> and I was shocked it was like the second or third time I'd ever spoken to Sean. Yeah. I was surprised that he did, thought that I would be a good pick for something like that. Um, but immediately it was an incredibly attractive option. And the reason it was so attractive to me is I always thought maybe if this pastor thing was going to work out, it would be like, get to know Mark Kane really well. And maybe he'll have a church of God that he can recommend, mm. you know, just networking in the Unitarian community and getting called to pastor an existing church. Okay. I hadn't thought about church planning. For those who can't remember, Sean Finnegan, he's the host of Restitutio, and he's also a pastor in New York in the Living Hope International Ministries organization. That's right. So Sean reaches out to you and suggests this idea that was nowhere in your vision for your life. Right. So one of the things that made that so attractive to me was I live five minutes from my in-laws. We love our home. We love the community we live in. My parents live 15 minutes away. My brother, his wife, and our only nephew live 20 minutes away. Mm. So, you know, we're we're in great position around family. We're very comfortable in our home and our community. And so the idea that I could sort of have my cake and eat it too, to be honest, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I really do have a big heart for the city of Louisville. It's very similar to the city I grew up in, Little Rock, Arkansas. There's a lot of historical segregation and racial tension issues. Getting to know the city of Louisville in the last seven years really has given me a heart to serve the people here. Mm. So it was a really fantastic opportunity. And so your family then, they're all in the way years ago, they're all Unitarians just like you. That's right. You won't have to struggle with anything to bring them in. (laughs) Yeah, well, and, you know, everyone has their views on church. And my brother, he's incredibly supportive. And he and his wife are still heavily invested in the way. Mm. My parents, I would say, are still somewhat invested in the way, and they're also somewhat invested in what I'm doing. They're open to both. Interesting. My in-laws have a different story and a different situation than both my parents and my brother. And so, I see. And so people are all in different on different spectrums. The biblical Unitarians that are already here in Louisville, some of them I know pretty well, some of them I don't know at all, and some of them are X-way, and some of them are not X-way. We'll be working with a continuum of people with a <laughs> variety of backgrounds. And so uh, it's a unique environment. And then the people that are coming in to be part of the launch team, nine out of 10 of us are X way. We have one loner who's not X way, and we <laughs> value her perspective so much. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I'd like you to explain your vision for the church, like how you, maybe a couple of details about it, like how you named it and what you're doing to get it up and running. Because it, it seems like you're taking your sweet time. <laughs> There's a lot of logistics with a church plant that don't exist with a, an organic Bible study. One of the things about an organic Bible study, which is great, is that there's no time pressure. There's no schedule of events you got to figure out. You just, you go with the flow. Mm. It's low risk in that sense where you've got your group of people, they get comfortable coming on whatever time you set up. You can build it slowly over time and you work with people that you have right there And that can change and that can fluctuate. People can come in, people can leave. That's the pro of an organic Bible study kind of situation. With a church plant, you really do need like a critical mass of highly dedicated people. I want to be very careful here because I know some of your listeners may have participated in a church plant that may or may not have been successful. And our church plant, as you said, we're taking our sweet time and we, you know, who knows if we're going to make it off the ground or not, you know. <laughs> so I'm definitely not speaking from a, of a place of authority here. I, I'm speaking with humility and with grace and understanding that there are so many variables that go into a church plant. But one of them is a dedicated group of people uh, who decide to come and be part of the church plant and are willing to sacrifice a year or two years to really spend a lot of their free time in that effort of building up. And so one of the reasons why it's taken us so long to get moving is because I'm asking people with small children to relocate from 
in some cases, almost halfway across the country Mm. to be with us. We have a couple, John and Anna Brown, that already moved from Colorado this past spring and summer. Episode six. We have, (laughs) yes, Colson Center. Yeah. (laughs) We have a couple that we've been friends with for a long time that's moving from Memphis, Tennessee with their dogs. We've got a couple with two kids, just had their second kid, moving from Boston, Massachusetts. Mm. And we've got a couple of friends that we've known for a while uh, who are moving with their uh, four-month-old daughter oh. uh, from Richmond, Virginia. So, And all of them have to take time to transition mm. to line up housing, jobs. And, of course, this has been a crazy environment with the pandemic. Oh, yeah. The way I like to describe it is there are five signs, I would say, or five things that help me understand that God is is with us. God is helping us with this church plant. The first one was Sean reaching out to me and saying, hey, do you want to do this? And that was last February, I believe. So a little over a year ago. Okay. The second one was after my wife and I talked about it, we discussed all the ramifications and how much work it was going to be. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, and we got to a decision where it was like, yes, we're going to move forward with this. We went to visit Sean and Ruth and hear more about Living Hope and what they're all about. And we got comfortable. Mm. So that was that was sort of like the end of step one. Okay. So step two was we started putting out feelers and telling people that were really close friends of ours. And we had an overwhelmingly positive response, mm. which I was sort of surprised about because I had never thought about planning a church. And so when I told people, I thought they'd say, you're crazy. What are you doing? <laughs> and instead they said stuff like, I always hoped you'd do something like that was a very interesting response. It was confirmation that other people thought that this would be a successful venture. Mm. And I felt God working in that to encourage us. Okay. The third step is the details started coming together. Like I mentioned before, John and Anna moved early last summer mm. just to live life with us to do, we were going to do organic Bible study together. That was the path we were going to take. So they had no idea. They had no idea. And then they, you know, (laughs) before they moved, but after they decided to move, Hmm. they found out about this church plan. They were very excited about it. We had another couple, the couple from Memphis. They had just bought a house. They've been going through the process of renovating it. I was not expecting this, but they were very quickly like, yep, we're going to give up on this house. We're going to finish these renovations, and then we're going to move and help you with this church plan. And I was just floored. Wow. When Sean asked me, who do you know that would be a good worship pastor? The wife of the couple from Richmond was literally the first person I thought of. I was like, she could definitely do it. But they were in sort of a similar situation as us, Mark. Both sets of parents close by. Mm. The husband's sister also lived in Richmond. You know, they had family really close to them. They're just starting their family, have this little baby girl on the way. And I pitched them, Mark, the way I pitched everyone. I said, look, we're going to talk about this one time. I am not going to mention this ever again. <laughs> I would love to have you. I think you have so much to give. But um, but I said, look, this is the last conversation we're going to have. You need to go back. You need to pray. You need to think about it. Well, they decided to come down and visit. Uh, during their visit, they, they were like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to leave father and mother and sister and brother, and we're going to move and help you do this. And I was just floored. Wow. About how many people are showing up from remote? We have four different couples that are up, have uprooted or are uprooting their families to be a part mm. of this. And I think we're going to have more. And hopefully we can help this with the podcast. But we really need young 20-year-old people who have a lot more energy and no kids and really want to do this thing. <laughs> so I'm going to put that plug in there. And that's the only time I'm going to mention that in this podcast, Mark. I'm not going to do it again. not going to make that. that uh, <laughs> okay. Thing. All right, well, we're going to have to charge you for the uh, advertising. <laughs> <laughs> okay, was that number three or was that number four? That's number three. So what's number four? So the fourth sign was more recent. The couple that's moving from Richmond, the husband is a sole provider now. Now that they've had their child, the wife is is not working. The company that he works for doesn't have a formal remote policy. They were remote during COVID, but... They were eventually going to go back to work. So he wasn't sure exactly what that conversation was going to be like. Uh, He was also up for rotation. This company also believes that about every three years or so, you should change your job and learn something new about the company and grow and develop different skills. Okay. Well, the company actually approached him 
and said, hey, we really think this job would be a good fit for you. Happened to be the job that he was incredibly interested in. He was going to do the things that he wanted to do. Almost immediately after inquiring a little bit about the position, he realized that the boss was going to be open to remote work. Mm. So he didn't have to work really at all to get a remote job. It just sort of fell on his lap. Mm. The fifth sign actually is very fresh. It comes from this past week. The couple that uh, is moving from Boston, they were the last couple that we approached. We approached them late last summer, and they agreed to come without even coming to Louisville to visit. Most of the other couples either had known us for a long time or came to Louisville to visit, but they decided to come sight unseen. Wow. They just had their second child. The husband just went back to work really recently. And so they decided to send the wife and the tiny baby down to Louisville to just check neighborhoods out. Mm -hmm. The goal of the trip was for me to drive the wife around and show her neighborhoods. They told me what they wanted. You know, they wanted a little bit of land. It sounds like you want to be close to where we are. We're in a county that has a lot of houses with bigger lots, a little bit more land. So my plan was just to give her a tour around our county, which is right outside of Louisville. So she's coming on Friday. Tuesday, before she comes in, the house two doors down from us goes up for sale. Now, Mark, houses in my neighborhood, my neighborhood's a very small neighborhood, come up for sale maybe three times a year. Okay. So she flies in. She has two showings lined up, one for a house about eight minutes from us, the other one for the house two houses down. The house eight minutes away, that showing gets canceled the morning of. So she's like, okay, we're going to see this one house. I still drove her around the county. And as we drove around the county, she was like, I'm really not seeing any neighborhoods I like better than your neighborhood. I said, okay, well, I like the sound of that. <laughs> so we go and see the house two houses down. And she, and as we walked through the house, she was like, whoa, this is different than what it looked like on pictures. And sometimes, Mark, as you know, that can be a good thing. That's or true. that can be a bad thing. Yeah. But usually yeah. it's a bad thing. <laughs> but this time it was a good thing. She was pleasantly surprised with what she saw in person. Okay. Now you have to cross the hurdle. A thousand people could be bitten on this house. You know, you don't know. Right. So they put in an offer. And I'm excited to tell you that their offer was accepted. Wow. They weren't even looking to buy a house this weekend. A house two <laughs> houses down just fell on their lap. Okay. That all seems to have gone rather remarkably well. It has so far. So I'd say we have close to 20 adults here already locally that are that are interested. Mm -hmm. And we have the 10 that are coming in. And I'm hoping that we'll have, like I said, more that will decide in the coming months that, hey, this is something exciting and something I want to be a part right. of. So starting this thing, what is the schedule? So like I said, it starts with getting the group of people together, talking about things like you know, mission and vision and generally what do we want to do with a church? Mm -hmm. Like, what's our goal? Why do we want to do a church? One of the things that we think about with a church versus a Bible study is that churches can be helpful for bringing in specifically unchurched people. Our goal is not primarily to reach people who are already attending church and who are already comfortable with their church. Those people are already happy Mm. So if we meet them, if we interact with them, if they decide to come to Compass, then that would be great. But we are trying to reach people who are unchurched that either have heard a fraction or a portion of the gospel and just have let it fall by the wayside, or people who have never heard the gospel, or people who used to attend a church but got into some hot water over something or decided that they've seen enough hypocrisy or or whatever the reason might be that they've decided to leave the church. Mm. And so our goal is to reach those people. To do that, usually those people aren't as comfortable in organic Bible studies because you're walking into a small group of close people mm. and you've got a target on your chest. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm the new guy. Everybody look at me. Yes. Yeah. So with a city as big as Louisville, we feel that we can reach a lot of unchurched people with the gospel message. So the first sort of step was to think about what went right in our own church past. And like I said, you know, nine of us were X way or X X way. So we had very similar church background and thoughts about what we wanted to improve from our past. Mm. And that's when we were thinking about the name of the church. And I referenced it a couple of times, but the name of the church is Compass. The idea behind that is that 
we want to follow Jesus. Jesus is the one who points the way to the Father. Mm -hmm. So what does a compass do? It points you towards true north. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the compass. The compass is pointing us towards the true God. Okay. Actually, I, I haven't thought about the difference to an unchurched person of a home study versus a gathering. Now, of course, we're, we've been calling it church. Mm -hmm. When you're saying church, you're talking about a location to gather together as a group. Certainly, the church is broader than a building or a place. It's the people, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So you meet somebody on the street. You don't just say, show up at my home Bible study tonight. <laughs> you meet somebody on the street and you spend a while getting to know them. You go have coffee and you get to meet the family and you build a relationship. And then finally, they're comfortable enough. Absolutely. That's it. Yeah. Cause I grew up, I, you know, I did a six month community outreach mission to build a large Bible study and we did it very quickly. And that's how we did it. Mm. We did it by talking to people. We did it by becoming their friends and then inviting them to our Bible study. And it grew very quickly. So organic Bible study, you can mm. grow very quickly, but that's how you do it. You have to overcome the obstacle of someone coming into your home. And the way that you do that is by building that relationship, yeah. having them over for dinner, uh, like you said, meeting their family, doing a hobby with them. That's your inroads in those types of situations. Mm -hmm. The thing about having a, a physical church building or renting a physical space, we won't start by owning our own building. <laughs> now you can put up a shop on the internet and people can just show up. I found you online and I'm interested. Yeah. That is something that doesn't happen with organic Bible study. Yeah, no, that's a good point. The, the typical UCA person who hangs out their shingle and says, hey, I'm doing a, a home Bible study. They certainly can attract the attention of the other Unitarian Christians in the area. Absolutely. For the listeners who've been doing that kind of a thing, what you're talking about can seem very big and very much like it's a risk, but, but that does happen. I mean, that is the model for a lot of people, especially in big cities. They move there and they're like, well, what are the churches in this area? They church shop. Is that ideal? I don't know. I mean, that's just what they do. Correct. There's a lot more risk to what we're doing. I think that's an important thing to point out because we've asked people, like I said, to move a thousand miles. You know, are you willing to move 800 miles? Are you willing to move 450 uh, miles? Yeah. You know, and, and people have done it, have already done it. And I think we'll have more. Mm -hmm. So do you already have a location? I mean, what? You haven't met in a location yet, right? No. Our first monthly services are starting in September. That's the other thing about church planning is that um, the different church planning resources recommend monthly services to start because you've got a new head pastor. Mm -hmm. That's me. I'm not used to preparing sermons every week. <laughs> right. I've given maybe three or four sermons, formal sermons in my entire life. I've taught Bible study over 200 times. Okay. But that's because I grew up in a Bible study. Right, right. So you've got the worship team. They're not used to working together. You've got the people. They're not used to coming every week. They're used to doing their own thing, or maybe they're not going to church right now, or whatever the case might be. I'm talking about our initial group of like Unitarian Christians that are already interested. Yeah. So we start with four monthly services, September, October, November, December. Then we'll start weekly services in mid-January. Uh, 2023. Mm. And you asked me if I had a location in mind. I do have a location in mind. They say, Mark, in real estate to not fall in love with anything <laughs> because you never know what's going to be possible or available. Right. But I've fallen in love, Mark. Uh oh. I know. But I don't know what the result will be right now. I have a friend here in Louisville. He attends a local synagogue here. They've got a huge campus that has a beautiful chapel that seats 75, hmm. which seems like the perfect size for what we would like to start with. But they have a variety of other rooms, including a room that can handle up to 200. Then their main synagogue can handle up to 750 people. So I'm thinking, worst case scenario, we just rent the chapel out for a while. We stay in a place that has 75 people. Yeah. But there's room to grow. So it seems like a great spot, but I have not heard formally <laughs> we've not reached a formal <laughs> okay. agreement just in the early stages so well, maybe we'll do a follow-up and find out if any wheels fell off the cart that's right the rise and fall of compass christian church the sordid tale of, <laughs> well i feel this is an encouragement to people who even if nobody who's listening is even remotely close to trying the same kind of a 
brazen and large endeavor as you are, <laughs> it's encouraging just to know this is happening, that people are doing this. That's amazing. We view ourselves as guinea pigs. <laughs> We're trying something that's not easy. Mm. And if we can, by the grace of God, succeed in this venture, that we will be able to provide the next group of people that wants to do this with a more complete template for how to make this kind of a venture successful. Because I think we would all love to see Unitarian churches pop up in major population centers around the country. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing that in 30 years, my kids could, you know, they get a job in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and they could be like, hey, there's a church here. Mm -hmm. We would love to be able to look at the map and say, there's no Unitarian Christian that has to go without fellowship because the only option they have is a high control group like the Jehovah's Witnesses that are just, they're everywhere. Yeah. But if we could have Unitarian churches, you know, in all these different locations that cater to a more open dialogue kind of framework, mm -hmm. it'd be amazing to have that for the next generation and the generations beyond that. Well, I'm excited because uh, we actually have dates for the next UCA conference. October 13, 14, and 15, that's a Thursday through a Saturday. Listening to you describe this, I think about what happens at an event like this where you're talking to people from all over the country. That's where connections are made. If you're thinking there might be somebody with a similar passion, well, at the UCA conference, you might meet four of those people. And you may find out a few of them have been looking to move somewhere. It's just the convergence of events. And boom, you've got a potential new outcome. That's what I love about events like the UCA conference is like, who knows what's going to happen? We're going to have people there who are probably talking about potential curriculum that they could use for maybe homeschooling or for Bible studies. You've got people making plans for mission work. All of this is happening because you're just connecting. And in the connections, you find new possibilities. Absolutely. Here's what happens when people can get connected and share a vision. Let's keep doing that. Let's see what happens in the future. So you can say something now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I absolutely agree with you, Mark. And the people that are part of this team have connections to us personally through the years. But the people that are also, I, I hope, going to join us are more recent connections, like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I just think that the sky's the limit for people to come together using the UCA. And we've already seen it. I mean, we've got friends in Indianapolis uh, former guests of yours, Seneca and Mary Harbin. Oh, yeah. They're starting a monthly Bible study in Indianapolis using the UCA as a tool to unite people in the Indianapolis and surrounding regions. Hmm. And so I think we will start to see things grow as people get connected. And I think the next natural step is for there to be other possible church plans. I think that is definitely a, a, a possible and even a logical outcome of bringing people together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My brother is the pastor of the church in Lawrenceville, Ohio. And we were looking for the location for the next UCA conference. And it occurred to us, his building can seat over 200 people. And he's got a social hall where we could set up the dining area. So, you know, for people who are like, well, the best model is small home fellowships. That is a fantastic model. It is. But aren't we appreciative of the other groups that have done other things and given resources that are available for folks like us? That's correct. Yeah, the resources that you can provide is a different level when you have a church, when you have a full-time pastor or multiple full-time people. It's just a different ballgame. I mean, look at what Living Hope International Ministries can put out and who they can support. They're supporting churches all over the world and have goals to do all sorts of amazing things in the coming years. But they can do that because they've got more resources. Mm -hmm. If you have the same vision, if you have the same goals, if you have the same ideas about what it means to live Christ-like in community, why not figure a way to do that? And if that's at first an organic home fellowship that grows into something bigger, that's fantastic. If you have the momentum like we are building to do a church plant, then I think that's wonderful too. Yeah. This is exciting. The reason I originally wanted to talk to you was I heard about your statement of faith. And I immediately thought, this needs to get discussed. But that's going to have to be next time. Will, I appreciate that you spent some time with me today. Let's reconnect and talk about that in the next episode. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm very excited for part two. I have more travel coming up, 
And so part two will arrive two weeks from now. I do what I can. Such is life. The event list has grown. If any of these states are near you, read all the details on unitarianchristianalliance.org forward slash events. In the next three months, including June, there are multiple events in New York, Indiana, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Idaho. July in Indiana, Illinois, and Oregon. Then September has one in New York. UnitarianChristianLions.org forward slash events. Some of you have posted comments, sometimes on the YouTube channel for this podcast or on the podcast page for each episode, and I appreciate hearing from you. Scott commented on episode one, The Perilous Trinity Deep Dive. He wrote, Thank you very much. This was very entertaining. And for 27 minutes, I didn't feel so alone. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. That was short, but very encouraging. You are not alone. Carrie commented on the recent episode with Amanda Dunn, episode 49, The Eventualist. That so made us feel isolated in central Queensland, Australia. But we are blessed to connect in spirit via this podcast and like-minded Biblical Unitarians on Facebook. Enjoy your mobility to travel and fellowship, Amanda. We used to have that approach when we traveled as Trinitarians and were younger. Also, hospitality is a blessing that many miss because they consider it work. But it's really about attitude rather than effort. Thank you, Carrie. You could be quite sure that if ever I was to have the opportunity to travel to Queensland, Australia, I'd find a way to visit with you. I appreciate you. I love to hear from you. Write me, podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. Attach an audio file or use the record link in the show notes. I'd love to add your voice to the others I've shared from all over the earth. And now some actual details of the upcoming UCA conference. And no, it's not the monster truck rally I thought it might be in episode 39. And you wouldn't want to hear that one again anyway. The 2022 UCA conference will be in Springfield, Ohio at the Lawrenceville Church of God, starting Thursday at supper on October 13th and ending Saturday night. The registration is not ready yet, so for now, just save the dates. The location has more space than the last one, We'll have a separate dining and fellowship area rather than it all being in one place. What's more, we will have a mix of content. There will be excellent theological presentations like last time. But you'll have some options. We are planning to have other sessions during the day. The evening events will be intended for a broader audience. And one of the nights, we hope to do something cool related to this podcast, like a program recorded before a live studio audience. Maybe a panel discussion. That's not determined yet, but as you can see, we are building upon what we did last year. If you were there last year and shared your feedback with us, your input pointed us in these directions. And I would like to thank you in person this October. Here's one more unique detail. The building will be available on Thursday, the whole day, before the conference starts. Why? Because we want to offer another way to support your efforts. We are providing the space to any of you who want to get there early and use the facilities to have your own meetings or discussions in advance of the conference. For example, maybe you serve on a board for a mission organization or a ministry, or maybe you and four other UCA folks have been working on a series of comprehensible children's books on God and Yeshua, the Messiah. If your team is likely to attend the conference anyhow, why not show up a little early Use one of the rooms, sit together, organize, and plan. Take the whole day. Then, naturally, since you're already there, enjoy the weekend with others. In other words, let us make it easier for you to get together in person. Zoom calls are getting old, and, and if your team is spread across the country and is looking for a chance to plan in person, allow us to provide a venue. More details are to come. But what I've shared today is a good summary of what has me rather giddy with excitement. So, if you have a dispersed team who would benefit from time together, and you suspect you could tempt them with a chance to be together at the UCA conference, then talk to them about this unique possibility. 
If you know someone who is interested in church planting or who simply would be blessed to know there are positive efforts underway out there, recommend this episode. Not everything is war, sickness, and decay. Again, I'm traveling all weekend. I will not be able to get part two out next week. So you'll have plenty of time to catch up on other efforts. And here's an idea. Reach out to a UCA member you haven't visited with in a while. Maybe someone you met at the last UCA conference. Connect and share a bit of your life with them. Will Barlow, it was a pleasure. I appreciate you offering your experience to us. We pray that God blesses your work and that many lives in Louisville will be changed for the better. Talk to you again in two weeks. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. Next October, prepare to get indoctrinated at the Mega Monster UCA Truck Rally. Featuring all your favorites under one roof. Flaming Heretic, Hell is Your Reward, and Appleplect Apologist. Experience breathtaking thrills as doctrines collide in crunching logic, explosive proof texting, and heart-pounding cross-examination. Witness the two-story tall, flame-throwing religious magistrate incinerate the opposition. There's something for everyone. Don't miss the kids' marshmallow eating competition and the butterfly house.